Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this wonderful event during Women's History Month celebrating women's leadership. I'm Maureen Mulligan. I'm chair of the American Bar Association Commission on Women in the Profession, and I'm honored to host today, along with our ABA president, Deborah Enix Ross, an amazing group of women leaders who, in addition to being extraordinary leaders, excuse me, extraordinary lawyers um, and judges, um, are each president of a national bar association. So I'm gonna introduce them to you in just a moment, but um, first I wanna take an opportunity to thank our co-sponsors from the American Bar Association, and I'm gonna read them so I don't miss anyone. The ABA Judicial Division, the Coalition on Racial and Ethnic Justice, the Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, the Commission on Racial and Ethnic Diversity in the Profession, the Council for Diversity in the Educational Pipeline, the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, and the International Law Section. Um, I want you all to know, each of you who are um, here today, that you're in good company as we reach maximum attendance on this platform of 500 attendees. So to all of you who are with us here today, thank you so much. And to those of you who are celebrating Ramadan, um, uh, we wish you well in your celebration. So as before we begin, I really agree with uh, Deborah Enix Ross's sentiment that it is significant for the next generation of leaders, male and female, to see this extraordinary group of women that we have here today, each of whom are at the helm of a national bar association. And I thank Deborah for bringing us all here together today. Um, we, I'm going to introduce you to each of our panelists. We have Deborah Enix Ross, who's the president of the American Bar Association, Lanita Baker, who is the president of the National Bar Association, the Honorable Tony Clark, who's the president of the National Association of Women Judges, Lucine Hopp, who's the president of the National LGBTQ Plus Bar Association, Sandra Leung, president of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, Makalika Nahala, president-elect of the Native American Bar Association, and Tara Raghavan, president of the South Asian Bar Association. Um, before I get started or before we get started and hear from the panelists, let me tell you that we're going to hear from each of them and we'll have a Q&A session for about 10 minutes at the end. So if you have questions as we go along, please send them to the Q&A portion of the Zoom. Um, someone will be reviewing them and we'll either filter them in or, or refer to them at the end as necessary. So let me start off looking at my checkerboard here. Um, Deborah Enix Ross. Can you tell us why it's important to have women, particularly women of color, in positions of leadership and power? Well, thank you for that. And I, I think the answer to that is literally on the screen, right? When, when I look out at this screen, my, and it, I guess you date yourself when I call it the Brady Bunch screen or the Hollywood Square screen, but when you look out at this remarkable group of women, you understand the power of representation. Uh, so for me, it is really important that we see this representation. Uh, we know that there are studies that indicate that when you bring women in, they bring different perspectives and approaches uh, and that you get better results when you have that inclusive uh, atmosphere. So we know that. We know that women leaders uh, sometimes have had a, a challenging journey and they bring that energy and that different perspective to everything that they do. Uh, but as you said, uh, Maureen, when I was quoted, it's really important for this generation of men and women to see us, to see how we lead, to see that we lead differently, uh, and, and, but that together, collectively, we are helping to move the legal profession forward. Thank you, Deborah. Lanita, would you like to comment on that same question? Yeah, I think that um, President Ross um, stated it perfectly. It, it's representation matters. I think um, for a matter for for all of us here, we've probably worked and given so much to our organizations that it only became 
natural that we would become the leaders of our organization. I think for women, so many times uh, we work to make other people look good, other presidents look good, but we don't necessarily strive to become that the the president or the leader of our organizations. Uh, I'm lucky that I, I've had a lot of people behind me, a lot of presidents that I've worked for that I helped look good uh, in their leadership capacities that also got behind me and pushed me to say, it had enough faith in me to say, Juanita, it's your time. You need to go ahead and run and, and you deserve to be president of this organization. I think that some of the challenges that we face is are we are always, you know, the people doing the work, but people don't necessarily have faith in us to lead, uh, whether it's the the stereotypical, oh, women are too emotional or women, you know, can't handle the, the, the large majority of the group. And I think that all of us have shown because I, I, I know many of the women on this call and getting to know them. I know we're some fierce women and we're knocking <laughs> down those uh, those stereotypical um thoughts that people have about women leader and leaders and we're leading our organizations to new heights. Well, one of the things I think that happens when when young lawyers see such an accomplished group of women on the screen, they think, oh, you you've always been there. Um, so I think it's, it would be really important to talk about um, what was your path to leadership? What were some of the difficulties and challenges? How did you navigate that? How did you get there? Um, and Judge Clark, would you be willing to field that question? Sure. Um, first, thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this panel. Um, it's certainly uh, an impressive uh, group. And I'm going way back to romper room. I see the, <laughs> the face. <laughs> But um, yeah, well, you know, my um, path sort of, I guess, sort of was parallel to my lead path to my legal career um, or in my legal career. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I worked, I was a paralegal um, when I started. So um, I um, worked for directly with one of the partners um, in the firm and um he once told me that being active in bar associations is probably one of the most important things that you can do uh, as a as a lawyer. Um, not only do you um, make a lot of friends, um, but you learn from others, uh, and you have an opportunity to contribute to the community, not just the community, the legal community, but the community in which you live. And so, um, I I I watched him be active. Um, and I took that to heart. And so I, you know, my entire professional career, in fact, you know, I probably, I was known in the Bar Association before I became a lawyer because I was a paralegal and I used to go to events with um, this particular partner. Um, and so, um, and, and some of the Bar Associations have paralegal uh, divisions. And so I joined those. Um, and so, um, you know, I was familiar with, the bar associations in my area, I'm in Maryland um, and, and I in Prince George's County, which is right next to Washington, DC. Um, I, 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 there are a lot of stories that I could tell <clears throat> a, 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 that happened along the way, some good, some not so good. Um, but I guess I'll probably maybe save that for another question. But um, I, I would just say that I've been active for a very long time. Um, one of my good friends um, who uh, is, was a judge in Prince George's County when I got appointed to, um, to the bench. I, my first call was from the governor and my second call was from her and said, you, now you must join the National Association of Women Judges. And so I actually joined uh, probably about a week before I actually uh, <laughs> said I do on the bench. <laughs> um, and, and then I've been active not only in this bar association, but I'm past chair of the judicial division of the American Bar Association. And uh, I, I, I was on the pipeline council. I've done, uh, I've, I've been very active and I have found it to be extremely valuable. Um, and, you know, I've made a lot of friends and I learn about what's happening across the country, which has been helpful when I bring things back to my state. So Makalika, can I ask you the same question? What was your path to leadership and how did you navigate that and everything else that goes around that? Sure. Um, I think I've just been incredibly fortunate in my opportunities. Um, 
I came from a very, very modest means background. Um, I grew up in poverty. I was the first child in my family to go to college. I'm still the first lawyer in my family. Um, and then when you look at indigenous communities as a whole, you know, there's only about 3,500 native lawyers across the entire country. So um, it's a very fortunate thing for a native person to even be licensed to practice law. Um, and I guess the calling, I mean, to be honest, I started out in college, um, you know, I admired scientists growing up and in my house, you know, we watch movies about astronauts and we thought, oh, wouldn't it cool? Wouldn't it be great to do that? And um, I also saw, you know, given the background and the means that my family had and also like the trauma of my whole community over the last couple hundred years, um, I saw the sciences as an opportunity for me to take care of my family, build resources and also, you know, be in this area that I had been taught to really admire. And then I went to college and I had a number of really cool experiences. I actually did get to work for a space flight um, research lab while I was there. Um, but basically, the more I got out into the world, the more aware I became of all the injustice that honestly I probably had been experiencing in my own home. But you don't necessarily think about it when it's happening to you. And, and I've had that experience, too, as a mother. I have a 14 year old and there is so much as a professional you know, someone recently asked me uh, while interviewing for a board, you know, you know, I get you care about all these issues, you care about indigenous people, you care about all these other social justice topics, but do you care about women? And she just didn't see it so obviously in the work that I had done, but I, it's just fascinating to me to realize how I had to express that because actually all of this work, I got more lit up into it because as I became a mother and I started realizing the things that I had had to experience and overcome, and that she was going to inherit that, you know, coming up right behind me. And that's hugely inspiring. And so really like all the work in all the areas are about her and this next generation. Um, and even before she was born, I had an opportunity. I had started work out of college before I committed to going to law school. I thought about it a little bit, but you know, first gen, didn't know much about the legal profession. Um, and I got an opportunity to join a tech company. And so that was more, you know, um, maybe intuitive, given my um, technical degree that I had just earned. And so when I did that, the division that I worked for got sold. And so there was a gap where I had kind of decided that I want to go as a part of this acquisition and kind of basically be sold with the branch of the company I was in, or did I want to do something different? I took that chance to go work for a predominantly Black, low-income charter school in Dallas. And doing that as a teacher, um, again, it's like I just saw what these kids were going through. And it's funny because I probably had the same experiences. But until I saw it happening to them, I didn't have the sense of urgency. And I really can't explain why that is. Maybe it's because we're all just taught to be resilient and just like move forward, you know, and, and not linger on maybe the ways that we're actually being hurt. But then I think a lot of us are natural advocates, right? I mean, that a lot of people are called to the law because they're natural advocates. So when you see it happening to other people, so I guess I would answer that question by saying, um, I mean, there's probably a lot of ways that I got there, but the thing that just sticks out to me is just like that need to do something about injustices that I was seeing were gonna just be burdened on these kids. And one of the things that I think um, is interesting to talk about in groups like this, where we all represent different cultures too, is how we think about reactions and women's roles in these, when you see these kinds of problems. And one of the things that I think I hear often is like, let's look to the kids, like the kids of the future, they're gonna solve this, they're gonna have these great ideas, but actually in my culture, that's not appropriate. It's not appropriate to burden the kids with like all of these injustices. So there's a, a very urgent call to action that we who are as adults and elders right now, we really tackle these problems so that they don't become their problems. So I think that um, that's a really important segue into the into the fact that this type of dialogue and sharing experiences and how people got to where they are is so important because it's important for um, both people who are in our generation and younger people to, to sort of see and build off of that. Um, and so I think I'm going to ask everybody on the panel this question. Let me go next to um, Lucene. What was your path to leadership and what did you find difficult? What did you find the challenges? 
Yeah, so, you know, I would say a little bit ironically for, for me and for many LGBTQ plus law students who attended law school from like the late 90s through about 2011, my participation in the Bar Association began out of a struggle. So uh, many of you might recall that the military um, had adopted a stance of don't ask, don't tell with respect to participation in the military for gays and lesbians. And there was something called the Solomon Amendment, Solomon Amendment where law schools were forced to allow military recruiters on campus to interview, despite the fact that at the time the military, that was, you know, it was a discriminatory organization under the law school guidelines. Well, we all knew we couldn't win that battle um, because if the military wasn't allowed on campus, the threat was to remove all federal funding. So what we did across on campuses at the time is um, queer law students, law students got together and we demanded that the law student schools fund our members to attend the annual conference and career fair put on by the National LGBTQ Bar Association. So that was like sort of our form of demand for reparations for, for the injustice. And at that time, I had a probably less than two dimes to scrape together. And so there was no way I was going to get to the, you know, across the country on a plane with an, a hotel to, to attend that bar association event with without this uh, funding. Um, but, you know, when I got there, I would say I had I had never been in a room probably with more than 10 to 12 other LGBTQ people in my life. Um, and to see a room full of hundreds of LGBTQ lawyers was such an, you know, the word gets overused, but it was empowering. It was, I mean, it was emotional. Um, it was, it, it was, it was a very amazing experience and it sparked a desire in me to ensure that, you know, others who came after me would be able to experience um, that as well. And so that's actually sort of what initially propelled me into service for the bar and getting involved is that I, you know, I wanted to do something to sort of give back after I had had that experience in my life uh, of being so empowered by it. And, you know, that's, you know, the, a lot of people helped me along the way. I have to say, you know, I got, I luck, I'm lucky. I, I work at a firm it's a regional law from the upper Midwest, Fredrickson, but the, my firm, you know, didn't have a lot of experience, didn't have a ton of LGBTQ lawyers um, before I came along. And they supported me all along the way and have a, a, um, empowered me, allowed me to, to build up and be part of this leadership and given me the support and back um, backing I, um, I've i needed along the way. So. So one of the themes I think that I'm teasing out of all of your answers is how important it is to build relationships and that um, none of us uh, get to the point that we uh, are in our careers or want to be in our careers without engaging others. I think that is a message that I'm hearing. Um, Sandra, what was your path to leadership and what were some of your challenges Sure. I had been involved in NAPABA as an in-house attorney for a number of years, and I spoke on a bunch of panels, went to our annual convention, but I wasn't actively, actively involved. I, I joined NAPABA because it was a great networking opportunity. Um, one of the most one of my most valuable resources in my job as general counsel of a, a large publicly traded company is the ability to talk to other general counsels um, in the NAPABA network um, and just, you know, doing sanity checks, uh, a safe place to bounce ideas and thoughts off one another. And so I really enjoyed being a part of that NAPABA in-house network and enjoyed meeting people at the annual conventions. And frankly, I didn't play a more active role in NAPABA for a while because I felt you know, there were some things that I, I with, with respect to NAPAPA, I thought it could be a more inclusive organization and that I felt some women weren't as involved. Um, and, and, and there were, you know, some things that happened that I wondered if it was as inclusive as, as it should be. Um, and then with the pandemic um, and the rise of anti-Asian violence, um, I really wanted to do more. I was um, asked to consider a leadership role running for president of NAPAWA. And it just came at a time where I felt that I wanted to make, 
you know, some changes at Nepal. And Nepal is a great organization, don't get me wrong, but I just thought it have, had an opportunity to do even more uh, to be a more broader inclusive organization. And that combined with the real call to action I felt with respect to addressing anti-Asian violence, I decided to um, to uh, participate in and run for um, as, as president-elect. And it was a, a, a great decision. Um, I've enjoyed being much more actively engaged in APABA and, and in the leadership role in networking with all of you on, on, on this call. Uh, and it's been um, you know, fantastic in the sense that it's um, I had I been able to work with a broader team to focus on the needs of all our members and women are an important part of all of our bar associations and we need to have more voice and that's why running for leadership positions is is important um, and you know so as far as struggles that I've had in this role uh, you know there haven't been that that many um, at all. Um, it's been some things have have been challenging. There are so many issues that all of our bar associations are confronting and dealing dealing with. But I think keeping a perspective on keeping the membership of your uh, in mind, the needs of your membership in mind, being guided by the values of your organization are really important. So you know, that was my my path to leadership at Nepal. Thank you, Sandra. Um, Tara. What was your path to leadership and what advice do you have for navigating that path for other younger lawyers who might be listening? It's a really good question. Um, well, for my path, it's been up and down, and I'll be honest about this. I've been involved with the South Asian Bar Association since the start of my career in 2003. I was a part of our local chapter, Saba Chicago. At that time, it was the Indian American Bar Association of Chicago. And I rose up through the ranks of that particular chapter up until 2008 when I was president. And at that same time, I decided to be the vice president of conference or was selected to be vice president of conference. And as a fairly young associate, maybe three, three four years out of you know law school, I was asked to tackle the biggest activity of our organization at that time, which was our national conference. It was in Chicago, where I'm from. And from that period, I was involved with the national organization for the next three years. And then I took about 11 years outside of the national organization. And I was involved kind of with the local chapter, our local chapter's foundation, and was continued to be involved with the national organization peripherally. Um, I also had some personal challenges during that time. I, I had a cancer bout, so I had to address that cancer bout. And then about 10 years later, someone asked whether I would be interested in running for president-elect. And so I came back after 11 years to become the president-elect of Saba North America. And I was in a contested election with another fantastic woman, Un, I, I'm not sure this is true of every bar association, but our bar association has thankfully had a lot of women in leadership positions. And I've seen that, you know, as Lonita was talking about earlier, a lot of women take kind of subsidiary roles on bar associations, including ours. And we've luckily had support in our network to kind of push ourselves up to that uh, president or president-elect position. In terms of challenges I had though, is coming back after 10 years, I forgot a lot of what the Bar Association did. And the Bar Association grew immensely in that 10, 11 years uh, where I took a hiatus. And essentially I had to relearn the challenges of the Bar Association and take on new challenges as we'd grown a lot more and we plan to grow more. For example, we started our first ever corporate council retreat, borrowing from other organizations that have successfully done that. And so to me, the challenge was coming back after kind of a period and re-engaging. And if I were to give any advice to a young young attorney who wants to do this now, is get involved as a first year or even a law student in the bar association and grow with it. Give yourself the chance to connect with the members of that community. Because beyond being a bar association, 
uh, at least for the South Asian bar, and I'm sure it's true with every other bar, we've created an, a, a family unit, people we can connect with on a more personal level. That's not just our career, but our personal lives. And I think that is what the Bar Association has allowed me to kind of relish. Thank you. Um, Lanita, do you want to um, try that question? What was your path to leadership and share some things with the audience? Yeah. Uh, so my path was similar to Tara in, in so far as it started at the local level. I will say my first eight years of six to six to eight years of practicing as a lawyer, I was not uh, actively involved in um, bar associations. I would go to events, but I never felt that truly included in, in the activities. Um, and so whether it was our local, you know, the Louisville Bar Association, uh, whether it was the Kentucky Bar Association, which is, is mandatory, I just didn't feel that welcome. Um, but I got to a certain point in my career that I needed to. So in, in law school, I was part of Nabalsa, uh, Balsa. I was the president of our, our, our law school's uh, Black Law Students Association. But um, unlike, I know, like Hispanic National Bar Association, their student section goes, they learn a lot about the HNBA as an organization. BALSA is not, it's not a, it's a separate entity than the National Bar Association. So I didn't learn a lot about the National Bar Association when I was in law school. But I got to a point in my career where I needed community and to be around people that looked like me and, and that specifically black lawyers, that specifically black women lawyers. And so I, I got active in our local National Bar Association chapter. I became the social chair because I now I learned the term I'm an ambivert. So I like <laughs> I, I like to be around people, but I also like my, my quiet space and my preference is to be at home, but I need to be around. I have a need to be around people as well. So I became the social chair shortly after becoming social chair. I think um, some of our um, my fellow bar leaders may have similar stories. The president and vice president moved to different cities out of Louisville. And so, was, so we had openings for president, vice president. I became vice president. And shortly after I became vice president, we were voluntold that we were holding the hosting the Region 6 uh, meeting for the National Bar Association. So all within a matter of two years, it's like I'm social chair to vice president to now, we're hosting the Region 6 of the National Bar Association. Uh, when the members, so the region is made up of people who are actively involved in the national uh, organization. So when they came to Louisville, um, for that Region 6 meeting and getting to hear so much about the National Bar Association. The president at that, at that time, who was John Page, uh, came. He was our keynote speaker for the conference. And just hearing about the National Bar Association, I was like, I need to see this National Bar Association. And so I um, that was in April. I planned, like, I'm going to the convention in July in Miami. Like, I'm going to figure out how to get there. And when I got there, uh, it was just seeing so many accomplished attorneys who were successful, who were doing well. I'm like, I, I was caught. Um, I, 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 I was immediately a lifer. I, I am, a, you know, the, like, I love this organization with all of my heart. Uh, and so, of course, my first year, I didn't become in leadership. But uh, two years later, uh, after assisting with uh, ben Crump's uh, campaign to become president-elect, I became his, it was three years later, three years later, I became his chief of communications, and I also was an affiliate uh, representative on the board of governors. Uh, so affiliate representative, I was president, I had become president at of my local chapter and um, the National Bar Association includes as part of its board um, up to seven members who are present, seven affiliate chapter presidents. So I joined in that capacity, which, you know, it's an it's a good way to come in because it's like no one's expecting anything of me. I only had to be elected among the other affiliate chapter presidents. Um, and so that's how I got in and on the board. Um, going into a 60 person board was like, oh, wow. Um, but um, I, I realized that my voice was needed. So I went from affiliate chapter res, uh, president uh, representative to regional director to then my first bar elected position, which was member at large. Um, 
to vice president, then president-elect. So I did the natural clown. Not everyone has to put in that much time, but I'm a person, uh, true. And I was chief of staff to our um, to Joe Drayton when he was president um, as well. I did that while I was a member at large. Um, not everyone has to do everything that I did, but I'm a person that if I'm gonna take something on, I know what I'm getting into. Um, because it is a lot. Someone talked about you. I think Tara said that she forgot how much there is to actually do. But when I ran, I knew what I was getting into. Um, I was committed to making sure that I did a great job. And I'm dedicated to making sure that the National Bar Association is stronger than it. It's stronger when I leave than when I came in. And that's not to say that it's not a strong organization. It really is. But as someone else said, we all have challenges, one being it's a voluntary membership organization. So we have to make sure and uh, that we are a welcoming and inclusive organization for lawyers who practice in every um, subject area. And that's one of the things that we're always um, balancing. And we're also balancing uh, not just making sure we're meeting the needs of our members, but meeting the needs of the black community as well with everything that's going on, you, uh, you know, police violence. We see the legislation that's being passed in, in various states talking about critical race theory and like those really impact our community. So just making sure that we're a voice in those avenues. Um, and so we have to do that. And I think that uh, Sandra talked about it. Um, another reason that I, I was, I didn't get into leadership thinking I would one day become president. That was never my goal. It was that every time that it came, like my whatever I was serving as ended, it was like, well, I'm still needed here. So I would I would go ahead and run. So I always went back and checked because it was like, I would go into nominations interviews and they're like, oh, do you want to one day be president elect? I'm like, no, I don't want to be president. Uh, but my organization needed me. And so, you know, in that call to servant leadership, uh, I did it. But as Sandra was saying, it's the the women too. Like, so as Black lawyers, we're very well represented, re representative within the National Bar Association. But our first woman was elected in 1981, and that's Judge Arnett Hubbard out of Chicago. And it, I, we believe that she was not only the first woman president of the National Bar Association, but she was the first woman to serve uh, as president of any national legal organization. So 1981, we received our first woman. Here we are in 2023 and I'm only the 15th. And so as a black woman, I wanted to show other black women that you too can not lead this organization, you know? So I, I am privileged to stand on the shoulders of a Judge Arnett Hubbard, a Paulette Brown who served as both presidents of the National Bar Association and the American Bar Association. So as long as I have women like that to look up to, um, I wanna be that for the women that are coming behind me as well. Thank you, Lanita. One of the um, one of our audience members wants you to explain what you meant when you said voluntold. <laughs> voluntold. Uh, it, I, I don't think I'm. I know I did not in, uh, invent the word because I stole it from somebody. But it's when you're not necessarily volunteering. So we uh, did not. The the Region Six director who was looking to host the conference in Louisville, Kentucky went to a state senator who used to be a, a officer a long time ago, but it's no longer an officer and asked him, hey, would Louisville be willing to host the Region 6 conference? The state senator didn't check with the, the organization. He said, yes. And then he came back and said, oh, by the way, we're hosting the Region 6 conference. So we didn't really have a say in doing it. We were kind of told we were volunteered by someone else. And so it became volunteered to us. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so I, I definitely want to hear from Deborah and from Tony um, about your path to leadership, either in your bar association or in your professional day job, um, whatever you want to focus on, starting with Deborah. Yeah, so uh, similar stories, but to say for me, I'm first generation everything, uh, first generation to graduate from high school, college, law school. For me, when I uh, graduated from law school, I literally took my uh, graduation money, bought a ticket and went to the ABA meeting in San Francisco because I thought in order to be a lawyer, you have to be a member of the ABA. Uh, and I wanted to be around what I thought then and believe now to be the smartest, most engaged 
lawyer. So that's how I ended up in the ABA. And I went straight to the international law section, which I'm proud to see was a sponsor, uh, one of the sponsors of this event, uh, because I wanted to practice international law. Now, at the time, I was a legal services lawyer. So making the jump from legal services to international law for most people seemed impossible. It didn't seem impossible to me. What was impossible, because if I could graduate from high school and college and law school, then nothing was impossible. That was my attitude. Uh, so I joined the international section uh, and I am a firm believer in getting value for my money. I paid for my ABA dues. I wanted to get the most out of it. So I, if there was a, a committee, if there was an opportunity, I, I volunteered, not voluntold for it, and, uh, and, and, and was involved. And slowly someone, I, I will never forget, Rona Mears, who, uh, step tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, one day you could chair this section. And I hadn't joined the section thinking I would chair it. Uh, and so I think these are common themes, but what I wanted to reiterate is that it's important to have mentors and it's also important to be a mentor uh, because she saw something in me that I didn't necessarily see. I was head down doing the work, but she encouraged me. And then along the way, I began getting more involved in other aspects of the ABA. Uh, uh, you know, it's a long journey, but whether it was chairing the Center for Human Rights or chairing our House of Delegates and ultimately becoming uh, president of the ABA, it was because I thought that there was a need and if I had a set of skills that I could use to enhance the profession that I love, and I have to tell you, I am unabashed. I love being a lawyer. It has given me a tremendous career. It has given me opportunities that I could not have imagined as, as a young student growing up in Harlem. So if there's anything that I can do to make sure that not only our profession uh, uh, is, is secure and solid, but is thriving and that the next generation of young people can see it as, a, as an option for them and join us uh, in, in all of the work that we do, then I'm happy to do that. Were there challenges along the way? Absolutely. Uh, and there will be challenges uh, and they continue to be challenges. And what I will say about being president is I hadn't anticipated what I call the three Ps, uh, not the three Cs, people know I'm focused on that, but the three Ps are the people, the personalities and the politics. Uh, and, you know, there's no getting around that and you just have to kind of uh, deal with it. And that's why I did say that this is a sisterhood and to be able to call on some of you and say, this is what's going on in my association this is what I'm dealing with. How are you dealing with that uh, is really very empowering and also um, very uh, uh, comforting to know that I can have this group that I can rely on. We're facing similar challenges uh, and how are we dealing with them collectively? So for me, just it's just been an extraordinary opportunity and I'm trying to make the most of it with the amount of time that I have left. Thank you, Deborah. So Judge Clark, um, you've been patiently waiting. So it's wonderful that we have such a large group. It also means some people have to wait around to have a chance to speak. But what about your path to leadership? Did, did you want to comment on that question? Well, I think I may have started with the question, but let me just say this after hearing everyone else, there are a couple of things that I think are, you know, sort of uniform. And that is that you, you have to understand how your, how your organization operates. You know, um, National Association of Women Judges, we have district, 14 districts, and each district has anywhere from two to four states in the district. Um, and, and that's one of the ways, you know, the path towards leadership in National Association of Women Judges. But I think that that's something that I've heard from everyone is that you sort of have to know your organization. The other thing is, is that many of us can, are, are really, if not members of, but eligible to be members of a lot of other bar associations. And so it's, it's really hard because, you know, I'd love to be more active in some of the other bar associations, but you know, it, you, you sort of, you almost have to somewhat pick um, and maybe do one at a time 
um, you know, but it, it really, it, it did, does really require you to sort of think about where you're going to be able to be the most helpful and useful. Um, and I didn't go into any of this with the thought I was going to be prepped. In fact, the last thing on my mind was being president of the National Association of Women Judges. The very last thing. And in fact, for five years, every time it came time for nominations, I would get a call. Can, would you please put your name in now? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no. And, you know, finally, I guess maybe in retirement, um, I felt like I had a little bit more time. I finished being in leadership of the judicial division of the American Bar Association. So I felt like, you know, even though I'm still very active, I, you know, that part, um, I, that gave me some more time. I just finished being on the on the board of trustees of the National Judicial College. That was sort of ending. Um, so there were, you know, some of it's a timing thing. And I think I heard that from some other folks too. So, and then the, the other thing that I think is really important is, and to the extent that um, some organizations don't have a lot of staff, but I, I, I would be completely, um, I won't say completely lost, but I would certainly um, rely a lot on the staff because they, they have the history, the, the, the organizational history, the continuity part that I think is often um, really helpful um, because most of us who only have a year. Um, I know some organizations is a two year, but um, most of them it's a year. So those are just some of the things that I, I think, um, what I heard from, you know, sort of summarizing what I heard from, um, or, or points I wanted to make from what I heard from others. So um, I, I heard you say nobody has time to be members of, of all the bar associations, um, which I think is one of the reasons why this group that you all have formed is so, so powerful and so important, because um, even though all of you are women leaders, there are different issues that face um, women of color and white women and women who are at different points in their careers, women who live in, in um, one community versus another community. Um, and so by, by coming together and talking about those issues, I think um, that in and of itself is really powerful to advance issues of the advancement of women and to address various issues of intersectionality um, between race, ethnicity, and gender in the, in the profession. And so I'm actually, um, based upon what I'm hearing you all say, um, hearing what Judge Clark said about not being able to be involved in everything, hearing what Lanita said about, you know, there are some really important specific issues to black lawyers. I'm, I'm going to throw out a question that, that, um, that we didn't talk about. And so if no one wants to answer, that's okay. But, um, but the Commission on Women in the Profession has a research project called the Guided Conversations Project. And that project focuses on how white women and women of color can help each other to promote women in the profession. And it is a really um, interesting project, project that assists um, women in having some difficult conversations by setting up a paradigm up front that we understand that some of these conversations are going to be very difficult. You know, there are certain pressure points. And so I'd like to throw out there to this group because it is such a, a diverse and powerful group. How do you think that white women and women of color can work together to advance uh, women in the profession? Um, if there's anyone who wants to take that question on. Can I start? Yes, you, of course you may. Go ahead, Tara. Okay. Well. Uh, we've been actually talking about this in our bar association for a long time. You know, not only uh, we obviously we have women of color in our bar association. It's the South Asian bar. But, you know, addressing the issue of promoting other women, period, and how to do that effectively. One thing that uh, Deborah Enix Ross, the fabulous Deborah Enix Ross mentioned was mentoring, being a mentor and being a mentee is extremely important. But the other thing that's also important is sponsoring other women in the profession. And to advance women of color, and I, you know, will put a special highlight on, you know, Black women of color who have struggled for a very, very long time in this profession. I think that as a community, whether we're white women of color or other women of color, we need to take it upon ourselves to mentor, 
mentor women of color and also sponsor other women of color. And that to me is something that has to be done in order to improve our profession overall. And it's sort of a non-negotiable in my view. Thank you, Tara. Anyone else on that topic? Can I just, I'll jump in if you don't mind, Maureen. I, yes, you know, we, absolutely. We happen, to, yeah, we happen to be one of those bar associations, and we're not the only one, there are others, but that sort of crosses all kinds of different lines as far as race and ethnicity, disability, and others um, are all members that also can be and are members of the LGBTQ plus bar. So our board, um, you know, has made significant efforts in, in, in you know, going back, um, you know, 5, 10, 15 years now to try to increase the voice and diversity of, um, you know, the those who are involved in the LGBT bar and the movement in general, which had, you know, for a long time sort of been dominated by voices that were more white gay men, to be honest. And so we've we've worked deliberately and hard and thoughtfully about how to promote and how to find um, queer black women, queer um, black men, uh, Hispanic, all kinds of other folks who can join us on the bar and have touch points with the other community so that we can support each other and we can promote each other and we can continue the more, the bar to me has been an example, for instance, on our board of how, when you start to get folks involved that just, uh, uh, you know, a, a diverse range of folks involved that just perpetuates itself and it increases and it and it really helps. Now, not everybody, uh, you know, some of your bars are obviously focused more on a particular race or ethnicity, which makes complete and utter sense. But um, I think, you know, what I've also found is that this group and many of the folks, you know, on this call and on other calls I've had with bar leaders, you know, we're always looking for ways and opportunities to support each other, to support each other's organizations in concerns that they have and make sure that, um, you know, the, the women among us, especially to make sure that our voices are heard and, and that we're all promoting and connecting across bars, which I've really appreciated. Thank you, Lucene. If I could just add to that uh, yes. as well, you know, I, I I believe it's said that white women have benefit benefited the most from some of the um, uh, some some of the representation goals that companies, law firms, and 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 other organizations have established post George Floyd, and I think it's important for us to not allow us to be used as wedges against one another and, and think it's a zero sum game. There's one slot and it's going to go, you know, to one group or another. And I think just, just refuse, it's demanding that we expand the pie and not limit the pie and pit white women, white female lawyers against uh, women of color and just be very conscious of that because I think it happens in very subtle ways and maybe intentional, maybe unintentional, but I think just having that awareness and constantly being allies with one another and promoting one another is important. Thank you, Sandra. Did someone else want to respond to that before I move on? Uh, Lonita? I was just going to add, I think it's incumbent to, and it, it's uh, similar to, to what Sandra's saying, but I think it's, and, and uh, Tara said it as well, uh, to be sponsors um, for women of color in these positions, expand the pie definitely. But when you, it, it's not enough just to get women of color in the space. If you sit by and let microaggressions happen, um, you know, oh, the they're angry or they, they always seem hostile. Like if, if you don't challenge the behavior that's happening in these spaces to create truly inclusive environments, then it's, it doesn't do any good to bring um, someone into a corporation or into a law firm if the environment is such that that person is going to leave, and then what we hear law firms or, or corporations do is say, well, we try to hire people, but they leave. Well, did you really create an inclusive environment? And I'm sorry, we don't have the power. We don't have the numbers to, to push. We don't have that on our end to, to change, to force change. It's going to take everyone. So the sponsors, the allies, everyone to truly create an inclusive environment. So sponsoring, mentoring, great, but we have to really create and foster inclusive environments as we move forward. And, and the, I agree with, with all of my, unsurprisingly, with all of my sisters before me. Uh, and But also to add, you know, 
this this is actually the best part of it is that we're having the conversation. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to have these conversations. So that's, you know, I talked about the three P's, the three C's that I focus on, civics, civility is that second C, and that's where we learn to have difficult conversations. And then going past the conversation, it then becomes what are the actions that we're taking? And then how do we measure the impact of those actions? So Lanita's right, we, we've got to get people, we've got to sponsor them. And then we have to see what actions we're taking to support them. And then what is the impact of that? Uh, and once we've done that, if we see that it's not having the impact that we thought or think that it should have, then what are the adjustments that we need to make to make sure that we are achieving those goals? Thank you. Um, any of our, any other panelists before I move on? Can I just add that I love that President Ross said, you know, the focus on the, uh, the impact. And I think in this area, um, outcomes, the focus on achieving outcomes when we make partnership or when we extend allyship, I think is really important um, because I think a lot of times when the trust in our communities gets undercut, it's because there is a gap between the expressed intention when we enter into spaces and we start collaborating um, and then the outcomes that are achieved. And so I just, I, I love that focus because I think Lawyers are just fantastic problem solvers. Women are fantastic problem solvers. Women lawyers, right, couldn't get better. Um, and so I think if we have a, a clear outcome that we're trying to achieve, we are collectively going to be very creative about how we achieve it. But I think some of the challenges that we have in this DEI space, probably across the country, but like certainly I think this can be hard in the legal profession, is we've got really good intentions, and then the outcomes are just not quite so clear. And so we don't have a meeting of the minds individually and in our coalitions and in our organizations about what those outcomes are that we are jointly contributing our energies and our platforms and our, all your resources to achieve. And so then, you know, just like any other contract, right? You can just see what's gonna happen. You don't have shared view as to outcomes, you're, you're soft contracting to achieve. And then those don't get it, and then, you know, you get disappointment undercuts trust, and then you start to get that divisiveness, that wedgingness. So I think everything that we can do to just be really clear, and I, I say this, you know, as a member of the, and now about to be the leader of the Native Bar, you know, we're 560 plus separate Native communities. So, you know, just like all of us represent communities that are not monolithic, that couldn't be more true than in the Native community. Um, and there's, you know, thousands of years of histories where these communities have not always even been friends, right? And so, um, like I always think coming into a space, even with other indigenous Americans, it's really important that I am really clear about my intentions. Like my intentions here are good. Here's what I think I'm here to do. Here's what I'm about, right? So that's actually also really important. So I don't wanna undercut that because the relationships are key and that's how you build a trusting relationship. But then you really gotta be clear about what those outcomes are that you're asking everybody to buy into and then hold yourself accountable to what you have contributed to achieving or not achieving those. And I think, um... I think that's right. And I think holding people accountable means that it's really important to collect data as to what the outcomes are, because then you begin to develop a data-driven narrative and not a, um, a narrative that is just created by um, anecdotes, which is, is really important, I think, to get to what's actually happening. So I, I really like what you have to say there. Um, so it, it's not time for questions yet, but I have been looking at the questions in the chat and a, and a lot of them focus around one issue. So, um, uh, and that is, um, and, and you all talked about it earlier when we got together. And that is that, that sometimes in your role as the leader of a bar association or in your role um, as a lawyer, whatever role you have for your, your job that you do every day, um, as a leader, how do you either separate your personal beliefs in light of your fiduciary position um, or remain true to your authentic self when you're also representing a larger group? Um, and I know, Sandra, you might um, you have to drop off a little early, so I'm going to start with you so you have the opportunity to, to comment on that. 
Um, and you're on, you're on uh, mute. I know, I'm on mute. Can you just br briefly restate what the question is? I just got to. Absolutely. <laughs> um, how do you separate your personal oh, beliefs yeah. in light of your fiduciary position and still remain authentic to yourself and yeah. be able to um, sufficiently and adequately represent your organization, which might have a different position than you. Yeah, it's 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 a great question, and I think we all struggle with this, particularly with so many things going on now today on the social arena and political arena, and things come up all the time. Uh, it, you know, particularly with uh, recent Supreme Court decisions. So it, it's it's a, a really good uh, question, and what I look to is I fully understand. And my obligations as fiduciary of my organization, and I will conduct myself in a way that's consistent with the values of that organization. And that's that's because that's my obligation. Um, I but I'm not someone who who can cut it off completely outside of my responsibilities for the organization. I would always make the disclaimers, of course, that I'm speaking my personal capacity and not as a representative either of my employer or of the organization in which I hold a leadership position, but express my viewpoints there either. But I think it's it's very important to um, always uh, speak through and, and carry through the values of your organization, particularly if you're the leader of the organization. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Who have I not heard from recently? Tara? I think uh, Sandra makes a really, really good point. You know, usually at least uh, most national bar associations that I've been uh, part helped with or have connected with al along these lines have kind of basic tenets that you have to follow. Whether you believe it or not, there's just certain rules that you have. Um, and, in, you know, as an example, every year we uh, authorize what we're going to advocate on behalf of our top initiatives. And for the South Asian bar, invariably, it has to do with immigration issues, uh, diversity issues, obviously. But, you know, we've added on in the last year voting rights as well as women's reproductive rights. And when we made the decision to go through with evaluating women's reproductive rights, it was a tough decision to support because we have people on both sides of the uh, both sides of the positions on abortion. And so when we were kind of connecting on this issue, we had to get authorization and the way our board our you know, organization works. We're an organization where our members are our chapters. We had to get authorization from our board members, uh, which include our chapter presidents, as well as our executive committee. And in order to ensure that we were taking the right step, we got that authorization uh, through a board vote. And so I think as we go through this, you know, there's times that we're going to see that we are not in agreement with necessarily the the kind of the, the the path that is being taken for the particular bar association we have to set that aside and that can can be a struggle but if you go through the protocol that your organization has set up or at least you hopefully have set up then at least you have the backing for whatever you've done so i think that that to me is the way that you navigate that difficult issue of your personal views versus your you know fiduciary duty um, Judge Clark, did you did you want to comment on that? Well, you know, um, that's what judges do. <laughs> um, that's what we're trained to do. Um, that's what we're told to do. That's when we take the oath. You know, that is sort of, you know, uh, <clears throat> in our DNA, if you will. So we, you know, the longer you're on the bench, the more issues come up that you, from a from a professional standpoint cannot comment on. And really from a personal standpoint, you cannot comment on. And so um, we, you know, we rely, we, we communicate with other organizations um, and uh, work with other organizations who can speak out. Um, the judicial division um, of the ABA has a lawyers conference within the judicial division. And one of the things that we rely on the lawyers conference, the lawyers in the lawyers conference is when issues come up that judges can't address, 
and and it and, and it would not necessarily be a Supreme Court decision or you know any kind of decision because we really can't comment on that. But but when the judiciary comes under attack, you know we can't really defend ourselves. A really good friend of mine, federal judge, when he when he stopped being senior status and he just completely retired, he said, "I got all my rights back now. Now I can talk," and he does. Um, but that's one of the, that's one of the things that you know we we struggle with is because we can't defend ourselves. We the within the uh, National Association of Women Judges, um, we had a lot of um, women judges come under attack. This was about maybe six years ago, um, and as a collectively people, it, it, and they had a, a elections. You know, um, they were they were elected judgeships and. But the sitting judges couldn't comment on things. And so we created a video. Um, we, we, we created a committee within a committee, a subcommittee that it, in, in, uh, that's entitled the Informed Voters Project. And they created a video that we were able to get out in the, in the community that just educated the community on you know, what judges do and how judges are, um, re, you know, one, how they're either elected or appointed and, and the things that because of our code of judicial conduct, we cannot comment on. And so that kind of educated the public who, who otherwise were getting very negative information from, you know, from commercials that were created by people running against sitting judges and sitting judges couldn't comment, but the, but the people running against them, you know, were attacking them. So these are some of the things that we tried to do to, um, to sort of combat certain issues. Obviously, we can't, you know, comment on um, decisions of other courts. Um, I, personally, I have a lot of opinions about them, <laughs> but I can't, you know, I can't tell you what they are. Um, and so, um, there are other ways of, of assisting our, you know, our our sister judges across the country um, that, you know, we can't specifically comment on certain things, but things like the Informed Voters Project or Within the judicial division, having the lawyers' conference speak out on, on issues. Those are those are the ways that we we have a we have a resource board within the uh, National Association of Women Judges who are lawyers, and so on occasions they may um, sort of speak out on the, on some issues that we really can't address directly. It's a little bit more challenging for us, um, and so we appreciate. <laughs> When the when the, the lawyers in the community uh, speak out about issues, um, you know, there were a lot of a lot of things. You know, my, our members were like, "Can't we can't we put out something like President Enix Ross did?" I'm like, "No, we can't." <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, but but we're we are appreciative and grateful for um, you know other associations taking a stance, and, and so I, that was all I wanted to sort of add to the conversation. Thank could, you. I, could I just piggyback on that then? Absolutely. So um, with the ABA, the president cannot speak unless there's ABA policy. Uh, and the policy is uh, adopted by the House of Delegates. So on the one hand, I might have uh, lots of views. Uh, we have media training when you're when you're becoming the president, which you know sometimes takes for some presidents and for other presidents, not so well. But, uh, and they tell you, you have no opinions for the year that you're president. Uh, in fact, it is suggested that even as you're president elect, you don't contribute to political campaigns uh, because you're taking on this role and uh, the, you, you, you need to be neutral and only speak when we have policy. Now, once we have ABA policy, then it becomes the judgment of the ABA president on when to issue a statement, how to issue it, what the tone is. So there you have a bit more um, influence, shall we say, on what you say and when to say it. And I have found that to be one of the more challenging yet rewarding aspects of being president is when I make issue a statement, kind of crafting that and thinking about what kind of impact do I want it to have? Because what you don't want is to dilute the voice of your association. You want to weigh in where it will be most impactful 
and where you will feel that uh, you are, are, are making a difference. So I've tried to do that with the various statements that we have made, um, but that has been really uh, a very challenging and exciting part of the job, but it all begins with what do, do we, whether or not we have policy. And even when we do have policy, as some of the, my sisters here have said, you know, sometimes it's controversial and we, when we pass a resolution, you know, there will be people who are saying, why are you wading into that issue? That's a political issue or uh, that's a divisive issue, but we rely on our almost 600 members of our house to bring those resolutions. And if they're passed, then that becomes policy. Uh, so um, that that is a, I think it, it works well for us. And, and again, what the president must then do is decide when to speak, how often, what tone uh, to take uh, and, and, and how to make the most of, of those statements. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Lucy Makaliko or Lenita, did you want to comment on that or would you like to wait until I um, the only thing next? The only thing I would add to it is that um, similar to um, um, what Deborah stated, the National Bar, like as National Bar Association president, I can only speak if we have policy for it. We have a lot of policy already. Um, the flexibility that we have is that we don't have to wait until each of our meetings. We can call a special executive committee meeting uh, that can give me the authority to speak on an issue that we don't already have policy on. Um, but I do, I just wanted to point out, I, I've seen instances where people are like, oh, well, I posted that in my personal capacity, not as president. And similar to what um, uh, Deborah stated, I think I, I take the position that that's kind of a disingenuous take on when you're president of a national organization, because at that for this year, or I, I don't know how long everyone else's term for this year, people know me as Lonita Baker, president of the National Bar Association. So while I'm normally active on social media, I mean, I was th one of the attorneys for the family of Breonna Taylor. So I'm very active on, on, on social media. I'm very vocal on, on things that I feel strongly about. This year, I'm the president of the National Bar Association, and I have to always keep that in mind before I, I share certain stories or post certain things, because it is going to be taken as the position of, of my organization. Um, and I think that as the fiduciary, we have to remember that and, and not get so loose with, well, you know, it, it, it's my personal page. Yeah, your personal page is your, your, your president's page, too. You don't have separate, even if you do have separate pages, you're still... Um, and so just go, go. But as the leader, I think that we do have a, a sense of persuasion over our organization to get the policies that we need to be passed, as Tara talked about Saba doing, like to get those the, the, that policy passed. And that's what we do as leaders is to make sure that we're influencing the policy that is uh, being implemented. Thank you. Lucene or Makalika? I just thought I'd add one one other thing. You know, I, I'm a little differently situated, maybe, in the sense that while the LGBTQ plus bar is by no means monolithic, um, on on an issue like, uh, for instance, the Dobbs decision that came up recently, um, there are certain issues that are fairly settled in our organization, and you know the the numbers and emanations from the Bill of Rights uh, that Justice Douglas identified protect our community's rights to marriage, family, basic reproductive health care, you know, and, and we, you know, and so those things are important to us. So right after Dobbs, you know, we issued a public statement, you know, that we support the health and dignity and autonomy for all pregnant people. But, you know, another key thing is that our, you know, community members, you know, the, a lot of the folks who access abortion and abortion providers also provide culturally competent care to trans folks and other members of our community. And my one thing I was going to say is that um, you know we our organization has both a foundation and uh, and as an association, and so it's good to be a little bit thoughtful. You know, if you are, you know, dipping your toe into the realms of advocacy, I think with bar associations, think a little bit at least about, you know, the tax obligations you might have, how you might um, split out funding and and make sure that you're you're doing things appropriately and, and not overstepping any boundaries. Thank you. Makalika? Otherwise, I just, I'll want, ask you. 
I just thought I'd re underscore what Lunita shared. Like I, I love the balance that everyone actually has contributed between governance so that you have, because we're leaders of associations, right? And so the associate members, we're here to serve the members and the members became members because they were bought in on the mission. And then, I, you know, as a practical matter, like as Judge Clark was saying, our members are all eligible to join lots of bars. So I don't know as a practical matter if they're actually digging into our governance when they make a decision as to whether or not they're going to be a part of it. But they do probably assume that there is a responsible, reasonable governance process that we go through so that when we speak, it's it's well grounded in something that members would, could agree, you know, think makes sense. And also it's just not a shooting from the hip individuals thing. And then at the same time, I also like how Lonita surfaced though, you know, we're just like any other elected folks in the sense that like not everyone agreed to vote for us, right? In most, in most organizations, we went through an elected process. Not every single member voted for us. Actually, I think it's kind of odd if they did, because um, <laughs> that would tell you that maybe there's, you know, that might be an issue of org health. Um, and so I, I also don't want people as leaders to kind of leave behind any of their influencing power because you were elected by a majority of your voting members because they saw in you the ability to lead the organization and not just not just as a project manager, right? And so I think a lot of the work, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what your jam is, is administrative and project management. That's certainly true in my bar. Um, but really you're here because you have a point of view that inspired people as to what should be for our community. And so I think, you know, I just wouldn't be like, my, I, my personal encouragement is not to be so like dependent upon governance and sort of, I don't have a point of view, right? Because that's, you are elected because people believe that you had a point of view that was worth listening to. Um, yeah. Can I just Thank add you. to that? You know, you brought up a good point because the other thing is you cannot assume is that all of your members understand how the governance and the policy or, or not how, but what they are, you know, what the governance requirements are, what the policies you cannot, I don't think you can assume that all of your members know them, although you would think they would. Um, I think at a minimum, you can expect they would know what the mission statement of the organization is, but I don't know that you can rely on all of them understanding or knowing what, what the, the, the governance policies and et cetera are of the leadership and the, and the fiduciary duty of the leadership. And, and sometimes that can present issues between leadership and the organization, but that is something that you have to, have to think about it, is how, how to educate the entire um, membership as to what, what those requirements are. Can I shout out uh, two point, quick points, Judge? Yeah. So one, uh, I know Sandra had to leave. So I just want to give the PABA a shout out because um, they are really good at this in my experience. So I'm I'm one of, I'm a member of their bar. I try to be a member of actually all my sister bars because I learn a lot and I and I care. So anyways, I get the emails from the PABA and you know, when they have to make tough decisions, controversial decisions, I have noticed that it is their habit to send actually a pretty thorough, thoughtful memo to their listserv so that their members understand the deliberations that were involved, how they weighed it out and how they got to that outcome, which, I mean, that's, I just think that's gold standard. The other thing that I think when we've got, you know, this kind of audience, 183 people listening, and I hope hundreds more later on the YouTube, um, not everyone's going to be the head of the bar, right? Like that's going to actually be a pretty small percentage of our membership. And I really want the message to be that everybody is that said so deeply empowered. Like when I think about this governance process, what we're really describing is so many ways in which our members are going to influence how we come out and also how much we depend upon as people in that officer's level we depend upon the members to help us get that right because we are a members association. So I, one of the messages I always say to native attorneys, it's like our bar in particular, no, we're so small relative to a lot of the, probably most of the bars on this call. It's like, don't feel like this is this insurmountable institution, like raise your hand, come into it. If you're facing barriers, come and talk to us. And that's the other thing is like, I bet that the women on this call, if members in your associations came to you and said, I really care about this and I feel like I've hit a wall. I don't understand how to make 
my voice and my knowledge in this area heard, we would help them. So I think that's the other thing too, is just telling people like, not everyone has time, interest, or any other, all kinds of barriers to being the head. I, if you want to do that, I think people like us are here to help you get there. But we're also here to help the majority of people who could contribute in these other ways. And we won't be successful unless we have that kind of engagement. So everybody is really deeply empowered. Thank you, Makalika. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so I'm gonna take a few questions. I've been perusing the questions in the Q&A as you all have been talking. Um, and there's there's one that, um, there's one question about mentors and the person, I'm, I'm not gonna read the question exactly, but the basic premise of the question is, there's, it seems to be difficult um, for women to get mentors, that there's a shortage of mentors is what this person is saying. And so can you address how there are so many different ways that women can be mentored and how you, what does it really mean to have a mentor? And how do you go about finding someone who can assist you in navigating a particular path? Um, who haven't I heard from in a while? Um, uh, Tara, were you sort of ready sure, to I go? I can, I can definitely go. I, I actually have to leave exactly in 13 minutes, but <laughs> I will say that I think the challenge is that people have defined mentorship in a very specific way. I think we think of mentors as someone that's ahead of us in our career path that can give us advice on the specific issues that we think we need at that time. What I've found is if you expand the definition of mentor, and you think about mentorship as ever changing in your career and ever changing in you know your ascent to whatever position that you may have you'll find that you might have a mentor who's younger who or who's in a different race cultural background whatever it may be some of the most effective mentors i've had have have been people that are younger than me that have just somehow advanced in their career in a different way than I have. And I think if you expand your definition of mentorship, I don't think there is a shortage of mentors. I think there's a shortage in your definition of what mentorship is. That's my personal. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, Lenita, yeah. you go ahead. Yeah. I think people are afraid of the word mentor. When people come to you and ask you, will you, will you be my mentor? You're like, yeah. Um, but I think to Tara's point of, I, I give advice all day long to, to um, I can't say your name, Makaleka. Nope, I didn't say it right. I'm gonna get it though. But to her point of making sure that people within our organization feel welcome and are that you're grooming them to like, I, I tell people, oh, well, you don't, even if you don't get involved in the big board, you know, you can go be a member of the corporate law section or the employment law section. You know, we have sections to everyone. So I don't, I, 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 you get antsy when people ask you to be their mentor because you're like, well, what does that detail? But if it's just an email, a phone call, like friendship, like a friendship, Thank like I, yes, many of absolutely. my friends are my mentors. So I think, you know, Tara's correct, like define, like expand the definition of mentor. But I say just lose the word mentor altogether and just start asking people questions. And they never know. Like I, I, I some people are my mentors probably don't even know that I tell, go around telling people, oh, that's my mentor. <laughs> because I've never asked them to be my mentor. I just start asking them questions and they answer. And so hence they're my mentor. Yeah. Uh, that, that is, that is exactly right. Uh, you, you know, people, there was a time, especially in law firms, where there were formal mentor, mentorship programs, and it felt very formal. And then you're like, well, what do I do? We'll take your mentor to lunch or talk to them. Then it, it, it started to feel uh, almost like a chore. Whereas if you, if you're, uh, if you, mentors can be uh, at every level, and you can be both a mentor and a mentee, uh, and you should embrace both roles. Uh, and, and so I think for me, as, a, as the president of the ABA, when people ask me all the time, can I talk to you about something? I always find the time, I don't know how, but I find the time, whether it's a you know 10 minute Zoom or 15 minute Zoom, what I can't do 
is when people send me an email with 15 questions. I can't answer that. I just can't do that. So what I will do is say, call me. And it's fine. I can give you five minutes. I can give you 10 minutes. I can answer your questions. And then I can always say, if you've got other questions, come back to me. Uh, so I think it is, I, I love the idea, lose the mentor, mentee, lose those titles and just talk to people on a human level. And you will find that you will get the support that you will need. You will get the answers that you need and be specific. I find I'm, I'm much more helpful when people come to me with specific things that they want to know, how did you do this? Or why, why did you take this path? What was it like working there? That's easy for me to answer. And it's easy for me to be able to then help the, that person along. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, did we hear from you, Tony, already? I, I, I think that it's been said, but really okay. the title is, that's a, that's a non-starter because it has certain connotations and then you know over over the my career people have tried to have form you know formalized mentorship situations and sometimes it's just you you don't have you don't even have the personality that matches the person that they've assigned to you as your mentor or mentee you know so i think it, in terms of someone who's looking for someone uh, you know lose the term but you know look for someone it, within your organization um, that sort of has either this has done things that you want to do or has practiced the type of law that you think you might be interested in and just reach out to that person um, and say, you know, hey, uh, can I ask you a couple of questions? Um, you know, and going to bar conferences is a great place to make that happen because you can just grab them in the hall and say, hey, you know, want to get a cup of coffee or, you know, or do you have a minute? I mean, that's how a lot of it happens. And so don't look for the more formal way of, of that relationship. Just reach out. And many of us are, you know, we're not shy about <laughs> giving, giving answers <laughs> or giving, giving some guidance as to where you might find the answers. We don't know the answer. Lucine, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I 100% agree with everyone that what they said on mentorship and that that should be like an abundant resource, like almost unlimited, right? And that we should give as much as we are able and, you know, take advantage of, of when other people are offering that to us. I will say, I think in my career, for instance, and 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 I try to do my best to think about this and, and perpetuate it where I can, but there have been people, I don't know, sponsorship maybe used to be a word you know, people started using for it, but there is a special role for people who took a, a, a particular interest in me and said, you should, you know, try for this leadership position. You should don't discount yourself. You should you should come along with me, and I will show you how to do something. You know that that helped advance me to get to where I got. And I, you know, I think it's um, incumbent on all of us as as women leadership. And I said, you know, time is always limited, but um, and that's the challenge. But to take a look for those opportunities and make sure that we're paying that forward and giving that those opportunities as we see them to other uh, women who are coming after us. Makalika, did you want to comment on that question at all? I love the pivot to sponsorship because I think sometimes when people are asking about mentorship, they're actually really talking about sponsorship. And they're really saying like, where are the people who have the willingness, but also the power, frankly, to help me? And how do I find those people? And so one of the things that I hope we are doing um, as women, get these opportunities to hold power is just encouraging more focus for women who achieve power to share that power. Because what I really hope the narrative is, is that by every time you empower a woman, you you allow her to accumulate power that she's then going to plant like seeds with many other people, men and women, right across the board. Like I, I'm somebody who's like very nerdy and data driven about all of my work. And that includes in this space in DEI. I have done an audit where I actually sat down and I wrote down every person that I thought since, since kindergarten that I can remember has really driven, like had a powerful impact. Maybe sponsor is the right word. Um, so who were my sponsors who really made a difference? And then I did best guess analysis as to what the demographics are of that group. And it is vast majority people of color and much more women than men, right? So that to me was such a powerful insight to have. And then I have flipped it and I have done an accounting to hold myself accountable and said, 
who am I investing in? And what does that look like? And what's the demographics? And so I really hold myself accountable. And, and it's not hard to do because I love it. Um, I have a lot of joy. Like I, I think there's a problem if I'm not invested in diverse people. And I'm probably not having as much fun if that group isn't as diverse. So to me, like the message is also that this is really no burden, but it is a behavioral shift to like hold yourself accountable. And, I, and I've said to this to people before, you don't need to share your list. If you ask me, I probably will, because I understand that examples are a way that people learn. And so I probably will do that for you, but you don't have to share it, right? This, this accountability that we do is not always a public exercise, but I do encourage people to think about that. Really say like, was I a good investment of power? Why was, why was it a good investment to put power in me? Like, how did I perpetuate power in communities that I asked to be empowered with, to, to empower, right? Like when I, when I went to law school, I mean, I made this huge career shift about 18 months ago out of a very corporate practice for lots of reasons, but it really is a shift into very directly helping my community. And when I went to law school, I wrote an essay that said, please invest in me, please empower me with this fancy degree because I represent this unempowered community. And I'm promising that if you do that, I'm going to put that power back into my community. And so I'm here fulfilling that promise, right? And so I just think that's one of the things that we need to be talking about too. It's not so much like, I think it's it's important that we're telling people who are rising up the ranks what they should do. But I think it's equally important that as those of us who have been historically underrepresented and unempowered achieve power, that we're talking amongst ourselves about how are we being good investments with that power. So we have two minutes left. And I want to say that I absolutely love the way you've closed the circle. Um, Makalika, because we started out this conversation with how did you all get your power? And what you're closing it with is we also have an obligation to give it to other people. And how do we do that? And maybe that's our next webinar, um, because I think it's a it's a really, really important comment. And thank you for making that at the end. Um, just I, I had hoped that we had time to go around and give everybody an opportunity to um, say one last comment, but it's been such uh, a, a great and invigorating conversation that we have two minutes left. Um, I want to remind everyone that if you have friends that weren't able to uh, attend today, that this will be shown on the a ABA Commission on Women in the Professions website. It also, I, and we're also providing the link to the other bar associations that are represented on this Zoom call today. And so your members will be able to also see it. Um, I wanna thank our panelists. You all are such amazing women. I wish I was in on those quarterly conversations and meetings that you have because there are so many great things that are coming out of this group. You are powerful. You are amazing. And you are just by your very active leadership, giving power to every um, other woman with whom you come in contact to uh, in this profession. So thank you so very much. Um, in the 30 seconds I have left, I just like to uh, remind everyone that the uh, commission, ABA Commission on Women in the Professions Margaret Brent Award Ceremony, where you can hear from more powerful women, um, is uh, happening at the ABA annual meeting on uh, Sunday, August 6th. It's an opportunity for us to give awards to five women who have assisted in advancing other women in the profession. It's always a really exciting, exciting event. Um, I hope that you'll be able to join us at that August 6th event. If you need any information, um, I always point people to Ashley. Um, I hope she has hundreds of people contacting her about this. Um, but thank you all so very much. We just hit the three o'clock hour um, and we're going to have to conclude. Thank you to all the attendees. Thank you, folks. Uh, are we all just dropping off or um, Ashley, are we offline?